Hello, everyone, and a very, <laughs> very warm <laughs> welcome to uh, uh, the Standing With Stones prehistory guys, Standing With Stones watch party. Who knew? Michael here. Hi there, everybody. <laughs> I, do you know what? You're just going to have to bear with me a second while I turn something off because I, I've got echoing coming back from uh, from somewhere else. And oh, I think you've so opened YouTube. <laughs> Yes, you know, get yeah. get with the beat, Rupert. Uh, no. Well, you can you know at what? least you can tell it's live. Yes, yeah. you can. There you go. It's gone now. Cool. I can concentrate. Cool. Hello, everybody. So gr yeah, so great to <laughs> see everybody. And uh, you've already been chatting in the chat for a long time. I don't know. I don't. I'm so excited about tonight. I don't know what how this is going to go. What to expect uh, or or anything. This is a, a bit of a first. How are you feeling, Rupert? Uh, do you know what? I'm I'm as excited as you are. I, I feel, <laughs> number one, just e exceedingly grateful that uh, that you guys um, yeah. are still interested <laughs> in talking <laughs> about this film that we made what seems so long ago. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know if uh, how, you know, how many of you realize quite how long ago it was <laughs> michael and i uh well we we met over 20 years ago and uh and it was a, a, a coming together of events and we wanted to make a film together and uh, um you know so we had this idea about standing with stones and originally it was going to be the, the plan was that um, there was a slot on bbc2 i don't know if any of you guys will um, remember this yeah. a bbc2 in britain for those of you who are um, watching from elsewhere and it was just a 10 minute program that was in between it was just a filler really uh, between other programs and uh, the, one of the best ones was uh, Ray Mears, who is one of our uh, outdoor bushcraft uh, sort of uh, people, the very best of them all, to be honest. And uh, and we thought well, that would be a great slot, you know, that we could just go to a different site every week, yeah, um, you know, and do a little ten minute program about uh, about all the sites around England. And uh, and we went off and we made a pilot on Dartmoor. Happy days and. <laughs> Uh, and then you know we pitched it, and it was in talks with BBC Two, and it was going to be happening, and and various things happened, and we realised that if we actually did go that route, then yeah. we'd lose complete control of it. We it wouldn't be the program or the film that we wanted; it would be what producers were telling us we had to do. Uh, so we decided we'd do it on our own, um, <laughs> very foolishly. <laughs> What were we I mean, thinking? You know, yeah, what were we thinking? I mean, it, you know, long term, you know, fantastic. So glad that we did. But yeah. at the time, it was, uh, you know, we had no BBC budget put in there. You know, it was kind of self-funded and insane. Um, but just the happiest of times. Um, it really was the happiest of times. Uh, and here we are, because um, the film came out in, what was it, Mike? When did the film 2008. come out? 2008, 2008 yeah. it came out. There you go. So yeah. here we are um, 13 years later. Yeah. Wow. Do you know and what? I mean, this will be the first time we've watched it together and with other people uh, in the same room since the premiere uh, in 2008 at Chipping Norton Theatre. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I That's mean... That's amazing, the, really. Obviously, you'll be asking us questions as as we go along. Um, <laughs> you said obviously. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. Or making uh, making comments, but uh, I'm sure <laughs> we'll fill so things much. in as we we go along. If you need, mm. yeah. And Chris was among us. Chris, who is among us, was at the premiere in 2008. Yeah. He was. Uh, uh, yeah, Chris, for those of you that don't know, Chris Brooks, look, you can see him coming up. Yeah, yeah. Each other. Chris has been uh, w with us, uh, you know, a crew member. We regard Chris very much as a crew member. And David, I saw <laughs> David, uh, David there, David Potter. Uh, yeah. You know, you guys just uh, crew members for, for so long. Uh, we love you to bits, really. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, just uh, more than that, you know, b because there was a hiatus after we met, made the film and after the DVD mm. went out where we, we just let it do its thing. We couldn't really think 
how things, you know, how we could uh, really get create more out of it. And we all both had other things to do. But there was a core of people on Facebook, particularly, you know, the, the sort of a core um, um, cult following, as it were, for Standing with Stones that was on and Facebook. And I tell you, uh, Chris and uh, uh, um, Chris and Dave, you know, were really instrumental in keeping that going. You know, and and mm. keeping prodding us about, um, you know, when we're going to make another one and all that kind of thing. You know, so a big shout out for for, for those guys and and that uh, core, yeah. um, you know, of people that uh, uh, kept us going. You know, when we were when we were doing other things, really. You know, and that's yeah. what brought us back uh, three years ago. So anyway, we've been waffling. Anything you need to, to say? Because I'm just going to finish off and get into the film now, Rupert. No, you finish off and get into the thing. I'm just looking at it. Matt's made a comment there that we'll have to come back to shortly. But so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, before <laughs> we start, I just, I just want to say a little bit about how things will go tonight, uh, which is probably a mistake because not, uh, not having run a watch party on YouTube before. Actually, I have on, no you, idea you about, dig yourself a hole. I'm looking about forward to how it. things are going to go tonight. Anyway, what I expect is for, you know, Rupert and I will throw in the odd comment over the film from time to time. If there's anything particular of interest that occurs to us that we'd like to point out, we'll stop the film maybe and make a few, take a few moments. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the other thing we'll be doing is watching out in the chat for any questions you might have about the places we visit or how the film was made. Um, we've got absolutely no idea that I'm get, beginning to get an idea now about how active the chat will be. So. Mm -hmm. It'll probably be a hit and a miss um, question as to which questions get answered and which don't. Uh, so we'll all learn as we go along. And apologies in advance if your question doesn't get answered. Actually, I'll tell you what, on that subject, um, uh, if you'd like to be sure, if you're new to us and you're not already a Patreon member, because there's quite a few of you there, I can see already, and you'd like to make sure that your thoughts and questions do get seen by Rupert and I, why not consider joining our Patreon community? As I said, lots of whom are here. Uh, there's loads of stuff there that you'll never see anywhere else. And of course, there'll be a, a closer connection with what we're up to and the content we produce. Check it out in the link below. So... Uh, Standing with Stones, in its entirety, is a two and a quarter hour film. Neatly, it divides into seven parts, though, each about 15 to 20 minutes long. Um, first part is West Country and Dartmoor that we'll be watching tonight. Uh, number two is Southern England, three Wales, four Ireland, five Northern Ireland, Northern England and the Isle of Man, um, uh, six Scotland and seven the Scottish Isles. As I said, tonight we're watching the first part of the West Country and Dartmoor, um, which has us begin our journey near Land's End, Cornwall, and finishes as we leave the megalithic treasure trove that is Dartmoor. Um, that said, um, the mm. very first place that we see in the film isn't actually in Cornwall, is it, Rupert? No, it isn't actually. No, it's uh, it's it's in Somerset. We do a we do a quick uh, um, wormhole time travel. Uh, although you'd never know. We, it, we <laughs> yeah. Mm, yes. Yeah, no, that black to... hole that Rupert starts off in is in Stony Little Long Barrow. Stony Littleton. Yes. Yeah. We, you know, I mean, we we had written it that way that it looked like yeah. uh, uh, I was going through a hole and coming out in in Cornwall. But mm -hmm. but the best the the best site to provide that that hole was Stony Littleton. Yeah, wonderful site. All right. You know what? Without further ado, I'm going to you're going to press that button. Movie. Yeah. Uh, that button. We're going in. Here we go. <laughs> Sometimes, if you want to shed a little light on things, you have to go groping around in the dark. And let's face it, when it comes to our prehistoric sites, the truth is, we're in the dark about most of them. A little light can reveal some remarkable clues, but what it can never do, on the other hand, is show us the bigger picture. I look so young. 
<laughs> I worked with all. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, I'll tell you what, folks. I don't know if any, you all uh, spotted that. Let me just see that. Can you see that there? When Rupert takes his bag away. I don't know if anybody noticed that at, uh, at Stony Littleton. One of the uh, um, portal stones there has got this huge ammonite in it. Yeah. There you go. Right. Yeah. It, that well, was the first it, it, but it's one of those... It's yeah. one of those things, isn't it? Like, you know, that you, you can only wonder what the builders thought they were. You know, Indeed. It's magical, isn't it? Animals. I, I, I promise not animals. to pause it that often, but uh, you know, <laughs> let's keep going. Hey, why not? <laughs> Imagine that our modern architecture could stand the test of time and that in 5,000 years, all that was left were the shells of our buildings. There'd be nothing to tell the difference between an office block and a hospital or a church hall and a jazz club or even a warehouse and an aircraft hangar. And that's the problem with so many of our ancient sites. They look similar in appearance, but were they similar in function? Across the length and breadth of the British Isles, we have a breathtaking richness of archeological heritage. Some mysterious and alien, some less so. This film is about that heritage. And it's only by being here, standing with these ancient stones, that we can begin to get a sense of that bigger picture begin to understand what these extraordinary places were all about. And, and we're off. <laughs> you dial it down a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to comment because a, 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 a few people have asked about the bloopers and, uh, and Matt asked earlier on, what was it that made me keep cracking up yes. uh, at the beginning? <laughs> And do you know what? It's nothing in particular. It's just when you corpse, it's, it, there's nothing funny. It's just somehow it's, you start giggling and it won't go away. And the more yeah. you stop, the more you try to force yourself to stop, the worse it gets. Yeah. And it, there wasn't it's anything the, funny. No. It, it's uh, just the internal uh, workings of my troubled mind. Performing, <laughs> being in a black hole with a camera and something else, it's all just absurd. So, yeah. Sometimes yes. absurdity gets to you. Right. <laughs> it's our very own expert there. <laughs> I'm not an academic, and I don't claim to be an expert. But I have been exploring primitive cultures and prehistoric sites for many years. Now, the plus side of that is that whilst embracing current archaeological knowledge and theories, it does also give me the freedom to offer some contentious ideas from time to time without getting the sack. The downside of that, of course, is that sometimes I might be talking rubbish. Who knows? <laughs> the yeah, purpose indeed. of this film is not to give a history lesson about our Neolithic and Bronze Age ancestors, but to explore and experience what they left behind. And as we travel across the British Isles, maybe we can shed some light on these mysterious places and the people who built them. So follow me. Yeah. Candide says, gimme, gimme contentious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like contentious. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, feel free to uh, ask specific questions as we go along, guys. We can, uh, as you've seen, we can always stop it and get to answer How your questions. How is it to see my younger self, Wildflower? Mm. It's painful. Believe it or not, <laughs> this wall is about 5,000 years old. But look what it's a part of. This is the Ballawall Barrow at Land's End, right down at the southwestern tip of mainland Britain. And its structure is unique in the whole of the British Isles. But its purpose, well, that's something else. There are burials here, and a burial site is very rarely just a burial site. And what's more, excavations have uncovered Bronze Age artifacts here as well, which means that this site could have been in continuous use for 2,000 years, I'm just going to pause it a moment there. You know, when at the beginning of the sequence at Ballawall Barrow, you said, believe it or not, this wall is 4,000 years old. 5,000. 
five thousand. Well, it's, that's not quite right, is it? Because it's what we actually right. see there now is a reconstruction by William Borlase. In, Borlase, yes, he yeah, uh, uh, he made right Borlase of it, really. But we didn't um, <laughs> uh, we yes. didn't fully appreciate quite how much. And I, I think it's it, put it another way around that uh, the stones from which the structure was built are of mm. that age. Whether yeah. Borlase reconstructed it accurately or not is another thing. Yeah. Should we just Stone. catch up on a couple of these comments here? First, yeah, Paul and Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah. Much appreciated. Very much um, appreciated. And thank you. Uh, I saw there were a couple of comments that I thought warranted. Uh, someone asked if uh, I've, I've lost the comment now. Someone asked, oh, it was uh, Deep Ashtray. What a great pseudonym. Uh, <laughs> asked if we've. Uh, uh, if we've pitched this for uh, for someone like Netflix, no, we haven't. No, not at all. Um, yeah, maybe we should. Don't know. Uh, it's just, do you know, we love what we do. We just yeah. Keep, keep, uh, keep Netflix on is a very particular case. I, I think you have mm. uh, you you've got to have an agent to work through. Um, yeah. it, it gets complicated, does uh, Netflix? You can't just uh, approach Netflix as a, an independent producer with something. You used to be able to, but not anymore, yeah. I'm afraid. We'll continue to sort uh, of look at those possibilities, but uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Lynn Bailey asks, uh, yeah, Lynn Bailey asks, were these filmed mostly very early mornings? Um, and uh, that's something we can comment on uh, throughout, actually, that, that yeah. many of them were early mornings. But we actually filmed, because we were on the road for, you know, five weeks at a time, something like that, that, um, you know, <laughs> we would drive between sites. We'd start before dawn in the morning and we would uh, keep on working until well into the evening. So some of them, you know, it just depended where we'd got to in the journey. Some of them were filmed um, just any old time of day. But we would always start early yeah, in the morning. We, we were that's, dependent that's on the contingency, and we'll sort of get into that mm. uh, yeah, as we go along. Shall I continue? Yeah, go on then. And I wish I could tell you what it had been used for over all that time. The complexity of this site is fascinating. Some burials face outwards to the sea or the rising and setting sun. Others are internal in what would originally have been a dark and enclosed space. The inner section was probably built a long time before the outer ring, and like so many ancient sites, it's not unusual to have differences of opinion about when they were built and what they were actually used for. Archaeologists have a difficult task teasing the information from the earth, and without thorough excavations over a wider area, Sometimes the conclusions have to be based on very small strands of evidence. We know there are Bronze Age burials here, but does that necessarily mean it's a Bronze Age building? We'll come back to the subject of dating later. To begin with, it's clear to see that contrary to the way our ancestors are so often portrayed, this kind of structure could not have been conceived by people who were savages, or indeed primitive. On its own, this site is a mystery, but it does hold clues, and that's something we'll see time and time again at the sites we'll be visiting. As we travel across the British Isles, we'll pick up more clues along the way, and hopefully gain a greater insight into the lives of our distant ancestors. <laughs> What's Potter up to? <laughs> if I was to visit, you said this definitely was to focus. You'd probably still be watching this film in a He's going to get time. excited in a moment. Yeah. This end of the country is probably the richest in its wealth of prehistoric sites. Within just a few minutes of where I am now, besides any number of standing stones and cairns, there's the Merry Maiden Stone Circle, Tregor Seal Stone Circle, the Nine Maiden Stone Circle. There's Bozkawanum Stone Circle, there's Pendine Valfogu, Karnyuni Fogu, Chunquoit, Lanyonquoit, there's loads of them. We'll get glimpses of as many as we can, but as well as some of the better known sites, we're going to travel to places that you may never have had the opportunity to visit, and quite a few you probably never knew existed.
just going to stop there a moment. Um, <laughs> it was interesting, um, was it Sibylla was asking a lot of people, comment on the lack of drone footage. Would you consider updating the film by slipping in some drone shots? Trouble is with that, Sibylla, it, it, for, I don't think it would gain much beyond what it is and uh, travelling to all the sites again to get the drone <laughs> footage. Um, mm. And I don't Do have... You know Sorry, and I was just going to say, I don't have a, uh, access, because it was filmed on a different format, I don't have access to the original um, footage it, to do a, a remaster where I could do that properly. It, it would be subpar if, uh, if I went away and, and slipped in new footage, I'm afraid. So it's, yeah, it's you not see, a, I'd put it the other way around, in yeah. that I would, uh, I would love to remake it completely, uh, with modern tech and the because drones didn't exist when we made this no. and uh it just there's yeah there's so many ways but then the thing is that with what we know now uh we couldn't possibly make the same film also uh, i mean the, the arduous task of like how long did you spend writing the music and what have you it was nine months was it not for well, editing it, it and was, writing and uh, I the think music once and... i'd gathered all the material in it, it was a solid six months at, at least Mm. Uh, probably more uh, looking back but uh, the, the I was in so solo uh, pretty much seven mm. uh, seven days a week 24 7 virtually um, yeah, yeah do, doing the edit and yeah. doing the music and uh, putting it together it's, so. it's a funny thing I mean something something that people generally uh, wouldn't be aware of really in, in terms of you know what what we do and how the how everything comes together is that you know, I have all the the work coming in, coming into the project, right? So you know, so I'm researching and writing and researching and writing, and then we and then and obviously, you know, I mean, obviously we're doing it together throughout. But the point is, in terms of how it's, you know, how that's working, and then we do the chunk in the middle, and uh, where we're we're filming and we're out and we're doing what we're doing, and then at the end of it, Mike's doing all the stuff that's going out the other end. So we <laughs> we have this kind of long caterpillar of work. Yeah, um yeah. and uh, so yeah i was just uh, having done all that you know mike would send me rushes and, uh, and what have you and say look at this look at this and and you kind of heave a big sigh of relief that uh, that actually it's looked all right and uh, yeah, yeah for mm. sure uh, amanda asks uh, uh, thoughts still the same guys memories of seeing the finished footage first time and watching it now it's funny it gets <coughs> a bit all gets a bit collapsed in, in time now because it's so ingrained in, into my brain, and I've you know I've seen it so many times since you know solo while I've been remar you know doing a, a sort of uh, uh, a cosmetic remaster for the release uh, last February, and I've watched it uh, so many times. Do you know what? <laughs> I don't, well, I don't get tired of watching it myself. <laughs> Bizarre thing. It, do you know? What? It's a funny thing. I have to say that from a personal perspective, I I I. <laughs> I, w I think we all do this, really. You know, you wince at your own work sometimes. But the thing is that I have nothing but happy memories uh, from uh, from all the time that we've spent out on the road together. You know, I mean, it's just yeah, uh, so yeah. it, it, any time I see any of it, it just makes me smile because we did have such a good time, <laughs> even though we were poor as church mice. You know, it was yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, an interesting thing about going back and doing the drones thing. Drones are not the be-all and end-all by any means. The drones do not make or break a, a, a film. Um, you know, they're just nice to nice to have. In some some aspects, if you want to be able to say something about a film specifically, then sometimes mm. you know it's it's handy. But uh, and they're mm. useful in terms of visual storytelling and so. But but they're not. They're not. You can. You don't have to have them. <laughs> in my no. my view, I love the footage I get from them, and you know, uh, there's been some splendid stuff recently. But I mean, I, I don't want to get in, into the deep dive on on that. Uh, where but was it? it? Just worth, one question is, before it, we go on. Uh, somebody uh, who was it asked, "How many miles did you put in on the Land Rover?" Oh Jesus! Yeah. Um, uh, we did this number actually. I, I'll tell you, we'll come uh, back yeah, to that I, one because I uh, I have that number yeah, written I can, down I can, somewhere. I can, I, yeah, I can look it up because I, I didn't I. I don't know. I might have put it in the book. Um, I'll have a look. Um, uh, but I was just going to say about the drones. I mean, I think the the very fact that 
standing with stones is the way it is shows that you don't need drones mm -hmm. um uh, because uh you know i can say it, he can't mike's visual storytelling is just it's just brilliant um but uh, but there are certain sites where a drone would have given uh, a a better view of what the site was actually about you know if if something extends like menenthal in cornwall uh, mm. that you'll see shortly uh, you know that that from the air you would probably get a very different impression of what the site might have been once upon a time you know? yeah yeah um uh somebody's asking about the music Dioman, i don't know if you, but uh, Dioman, you are correct uh i did make the music i i, I wrote the main theme and the main thing uh, and uh there was a, an excellent piece of software that helps compose stuff that i used as a sort of shorthand for the incidental music but the main theme was and uh Anything that references the main theme was uh, written by myself and composed and performed by myself, believe it or not. Okay, that's enough of me. Did you want to say anything else? What? So I was just pointing at you, composer, and I'm pointing the wrong <laughs> way. But that's, that's the, um, yes, I uh, yes I, I'm just, I don't want to miss some of these questions. Uh, have we got plans to make other films, other sites? Uh, Jenny, we already have. And, oh, if you're from the Isle of Arran, uh, sorry we missed you on this journey. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> that was yeah. pure logistics and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Ma uh, uh, Macri Moor, absolutely dying to get there. And uh, uh, and also fascinated by the discovery of uh, a cursor's near Macri Moor. Um, Indeed. Uh, early this year. Um, anyway, yeah, we'd love to do that. And we are always looking to make new films, but we're a bit stuck at the moment because of uh, pandemic and all. I'm going to move the movie uh, along because we're... Um, do it, because otherwise, otherwise we'll be there. here till three in the morning exactly. and people won't thank us. Yeah. <laughs> You know those clues I mentioned? <laughs> this isn't one of this them. This isn't one of them. And to further confound you, this is not a stone circle. I told you to write that, didn't I? You did. Every <laughs> region has its idiosyncrasies, <laughs> and that's what fascinates me. All across Britain, you find stone circles, standing stones, cairns, dolmens, barrows, henges. Perhaps these other structures can shed some light on the oddities, such as this one. This little monument is called Men and Toll. And myth has it that passing through this hole can cure your ills. It's even said to aid women's fertility. People believe all sorts of things, but in reality, <laughs> and you'll hear it said a lot on this journey, we just don't have a clue what it was for. We were blessed with the weather in Cornwall, were we not? Oh, we really Those were. Those are gorgeous days. <clears throat> Very, very what we do know is that even a modest arrangement such as Men and Toll, leaving aside the size of some of the sites we're yet to visit, <laughs> would have taken considerable time and effort to create. And that scale of time I don't know and if effort that would have could cured only be afforded in. by sizable communities. That's communities of people with a unity of thought. map first of the map bits mm. goodness gracious often hidden away in intimate secluded settings the traces of our ancestors can still be found frozen in time it would be easy to walk straight past these archetypal bronze age maze carvings but even such small remnants give us tantalizing glimpses into both the mundane and the more mystical aspects of their lives. Makes me realize, Rupert, you know, that we were co it's quite dependent on we your. Tend to look out for big, uh, you, you had local knowledge, you, you knew a lot of these sites to, to begin with. Day -day yes. lives yeah. Sometimes pass yes. unnoticed. Uh, I just spent so many years uh, exploring, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, things like the, the Bronze Age carvings Here at Routle, in the Rocky on Valley. Bodmin Moor, the remains yeah, of a but, Bronze uh, Age village is almost lost in the landscape. Hmm. Uh, 
Yeah. We could talk lots about uh, Men and Toll, actually. But a closer look but, reveals the true scale of the site, which was probably home to large numbers of people. Correct, David, yes, Rocky Valley. Oh, I'll just pause briefly. Uh, this is the bit where we missed something over to the left there, and I <laughs> subsequently made a film uh, well, in two and a half years ago about it. Um, that's the, um, the the Rautor Long Cairn. It completely mm. mi we we missed, but there there it is in the landscape. And it was only when I saw a a time team where they dug down on on the very uh, hot circles that we're looking at now. Um, but they also dug down on this long strip of uh, of care material that stretches up the uh, the hillside, and it's known as the uh, uh, the Rautor Long Cairn. Uh, I made a film about it, uh, and uh, it's in the um, on the channel somewhere. With that, I shall continue. Out on open moors are often the remains of what could have been huge ceremonial sites, like the three-circle complex of the Hurlers, long since absorbed into religious folklore as men turned to stone for dancing on the Sabbath. Many smaller sites, like the gleaming white quartz circle further south at Dulo, can be easily missed. <laughs> Tucked away behind hedges and farm walls, people pass them by unknowingly, leaving them to be appreciated only by the local inhabitants. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Bless the little animals. <laughs> mm. You could tell we're going somewhere different Dartmoor by the music. is one of my <laughs> favourite places in the whole of England. <laughs> And I've been exploring here for over 20 years. 365 square miles of rolling moors with a huge variety of prehistoric structures. It's so unspoilt in archaeological terms that it gives us a much clearer idea of what the whole country used to be like. Miles of moorland covered in stone circles, cairns and kists, settlements, barrows, standing stones. And these? Stone roads are a bit of a mystery, and Dartmoor has the greatest concentration anywhere. There's over 60 of them dotted across the moor, and of such variety, they must have had lots of different functions. Here, I'm at Merivale, right in the middle of Dartmoor. Sorry, do you want to say something, and Rupert? this site has a bit of everything. <laughs> there's just, uh, it's like every time around. there's, uh, there's I say something, and I'm there. thinking of a possible there's outtake that might have happened. a big stone circle <laughs> with a huge standing stone yeah. over there. There's mm. cairns dotted all around, and these stone rows didn't right in the middle of it all. <laughs> yeah. And you want to see what's in the middle of this row. Yeah, everybody seems it's to be remembering small, the blue. It's only small, but this little funereal <laughs> box called a kist does imply that this was a processionary pathway. So what do we have here? A temple in the centre of a big community? In many cases, the rows lead to cairns or stone circles, but of all the rows across the moor, none of them point in the same direction. Some people have theorised that they may have had astronomical alignments, but frankly, a line will always point at something, and there's so much inconsistency that the idea doesn't hold water. It seems much more likely that the rows didn't relate to anything outside the community. I'll just uh, pause there uh, a moment, Rupert. Uh, two things. Um, I'm going to say, for those of you wondering, it's because, uh, you know, as usual, I'm in my studio just on a video link. Mike's the one that's got all the controls. So if you're yes. wondering why he's stopping it and I'm not, it's because I haven't got any buttons. <laughs> uh, no, all right. Uh, disclaimer. <laughs> um, it's all my fault. Um, yeah, what I was going, going to say, because we've come to Dartmoor, Cheers, is giving buddy. people a heads up that uh, the next interview we'll be pushing out uh, is with Lee 
Um, Lee Bray. Lee Bray, Bray. who's head lead Mm. archaeologist uh, for the whole of Dartmoor. Uh, yeah, we had a great you? talk with him, um, you know, about mm. Stone Rose. New thoughts about the dating of Stone Rose, mm. you know, a- and all the stuff on uh, on Dartmoor. But we cover um, quite a lot of ground, and we get into a really good mm. amount of detail uh, on the subject of, of Dartmoor. He was wonderful to talk to. Yeah, so. yeah. So w- mm. watch out for that coming out in the next couple of weeks. The audio version, the audio-only podcast will precede the... Mm. Uh, the, the video one and uh, Patreon folks will get that first hooray they get their own mm. very, very own version uh, Riss asked did we stay on campsites each night or did uh, you just camp up where you ended uh, each day bit of both bit of both actually uh, <laughs> you were, we were in a, a camper van um, um, so yeah we, we played the ball where it lied as far as that concerned because we, we it was so difficult to predict that was a great thing of not having an absolute set schedule that we were so flexible when we were making it. We could make it up as we, you know, kind of, although we had a script before we set out, we could re- adjust and make it up as we go along. What tickled your. Oh, it's just people commenting. Diane bone. said, Can I be trusted with buttons? And then Lynn said, Don't <laughs> give Rupert a red button. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Yeah. Um, why, um, uh, Petrarian says, why the hell do you call those stone boxes kist? Kist literally means box in German. Uh, is there mm. any reason why you use a German word instead of the same word in uh, in English? Good question. It's, it is a good question. And the honest truth is um, it's, it's an archaeological term and yeah. it very probably does come from uh, from German usage but uh, a stone I don't know the etymology of burial that at all. box yeah it may, uh, kind of makes stone sense burial box is called a kist um, yeah yeah uh, yeah it's a good question uh, I've never questioned it and yeah. I'll look it up and get back to you <laughs> well, well there are all sorts of fascinating mysteries about why certain kinds of monuments are, are called the way way they are That that's a that's mm. quite, a, quite a long grass question if we start doing a deep dive, isn't it? <laughs> we can get into why yeah, are quoits, yeah, yeah. quoits, I mean, and why are, are you there, Cork? Uh, why are quoits, <sighs> quoits, and why are, um, uh, yeah. uh, why are dolmens, dolmens, and why, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you do get the, a lot of regional differences. I mean, if you compare a vocabulary between Britain and France, for example, then... Uh, yeah. You know, cromlechs and dolmens Cromlicks, and what yeah, have you. Like the word oh, I was trying to think of. just goes all over the place, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is true. With that, I shall Kist continue. Kist means chest in Dutch. Okay, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. gosh, yeah. yeah. Onward. Mm. There's something else to bear in mind. These barren landscapes are entirely the work of our farming ancestors. About 12,000 years ago, the whole moor was covered in forest and it was about this time that hunter-gatherers began felling trees to make the first clearings. The reason was simple enough. If you can encourage animals to graze in the clearings that you've made, then hunting is a much, much easier job. So people would stay around their hunting grounds, settlements would develop, until about 4,000 years ago, domestic farming had become a way of life. (laughs) <laughs> Anybody catch the subliminal sheep there? I just caught that. I remember the sheep weren't That's... there. I don't know why I put those in. Uh, listen, uh, listen. Uh, farming had become a way of life. <laughs> so did uh, these rows lead people across open moor or through dense forest? I must have put sheep in there to make people subliminally think of herding stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. That's an interesting... <laughs> uh, yeah. Up on yeah. this high ground, you get a real sense of the past. <laughs> Spreading out across sheep, the Kevin. landscape are all the signs <laughs> of a fully rounded community. <laughs> mm. What's the name of that oh, stone? God, I love that place. Drizzlecombe. Yeah. It's, it's Drizzlecombe Stone Rose. But that, that stone has a weird name, doesn't it? 
Oh, what the, that the fish stone all, the tall one. Yeah, yeah, it does. I can't remember. Here, that one is, actually. we're on the mm. southwest side we of go. the moor, on top of Guttertor. <laughs> Way over there in the distance is Higher Heart or Tor. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you might just be able to make out down there the Drizzlecombe Stone Rose. These wonderful evocative names are sometimes the lingering legacy of a long forgotten history. For instance, over there behind Higher Heart or Tor, there's a valley called <laughs> Evil Tomb. Still cracks me up the I really wish I could tell you stories of black magic Higher and ritual Heart sacrifice. Mm. But actually, the name comes from the valley's tin mining past. And an evil was a, just a short handled pick that the miners used to use to extract ore from the rocks. So sorry to disappoint on that one, but still good for frightening the kids, though. Let's go and have a look at those rows. Yeah. Gosh, <laughs> as if frightening the kids was a thing. Let's not go there. I know. I know. I'll get a reputation. Oh. Well, Diane's told us to be quiet. Her giggling is interfering with her chat. <laughs> To do little. I do like the animals. <laughs> it, this shot is a good example, I think, of when I told Rupert to do something and he didn't have a clue what I was up to. Is no, that true? You just had what, to take it on faith. That I, hmm? I didn't know what you were up to. Yeah, I, no, you I, just I had trusted. To... I, I trusted that you had something in mind, and I just uh, <laughs> well, you were very trusting in the wash. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we did have walkie-talkies. That was the other thing. I could say now walk. Yeah. And stuff. You yeah. have no idea how many miles I walked while he stood there by a tripod. Yeah. yeah, can you just do that again? And then, exactly know, that, yeah. Wait, yeah. I walked miles. <laughs> you remember that little kist we saw in the middle of the road at Merivale? Oh, this is a perfect Bronze Age example. It's about 4,000 years old, and basically it's a stone box. And it would have held the remains of an individual or even a family sometimes with a cover stone, and then the whole thing would have been covered with a mound of earth called Cam. Hey. Mm. This is Yellowmead, just north of Gattator, that you can probably see up there behind me. It's where we were earlier. And this place is incredibly unusual. It's a quadruple stone circle. It's strange, there's no alignments amongst the stones to suggest astronomy, and there's no central kist to suggest an elaborate burial. Just these enigmatic rings. Do you want to stop it here? Yeah, exactly my thought. Yeah, um, because um, can you can you uh, can you take us to the widest possible view of yellow meat? Sure, I'll do my best. Well, there that, are theories. A, there was supposed to have been uh, a one shot. Uh, but as we were leading into it. Is um, uh, because when we were, yeah, uh, kind of stop, yeah, stop there, that'll do, that'll yeah. Do. Um, because uh, at the time, uh, we you know, but well, you heard what we said <laughs> in the script, you know, that there's no central burial, there's no you know, there's no kist in the middle to suggest uh, a, a lavish burial. You know, it's just these enigmatic rings. Well, the thing is that it was, it was only when we went up to Templewood in Scotland 
mm. um, in Kilmartin Glen. And there is um, uh, uh, there is a multiple stone circle that is still part of a burial. Um, and uh, if you imagine these circles of stones now completely infilled with yeah. cobbles, so that entire floor is cobbles that are just restrained by those. Those are basically retaining walls, that yeah. the circles. Um, and if you imagine that then, so the reason there's no central kist is because the stones have been long since robbed out. A lot of the stones have been robbed out anyway. Uh, so the cobbles would have actually been to a height where the kist would have been sunk into the cobbles. That's why there's yeah. nothing left to see because it's all been yeah. robbed out. Now, the thing is that if you, um, if you then... Uh, imagine that as a central burial and that's cobble flooring all the way out to the external circle yeah. that is a colossal colossal burial mound uh, it, yeah. it must have been such an important place mm. and at the time we had absolutely no idea that was only yeah. you know, we just uh, saw it as a, a weird uh, quadruple mm. uh, stone circle yeah. but when you imagine it as a, a huge uh, kist and mound uh, mm. with those as internal retainers. Um, yeah, it would have been also, vast. Yeah. So, uh, 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 it, it, memory serves me there's also a, a, a ditch and bank, a sl the remains of a ditch and yeah, bank outside Yeah, there is. Yeah, well. I mean, there's yeah. so little to be seen of it uh, now. It's all, you know, ploughed out. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those, you don't see many hugely, you know, visibly yeah. important sites on Dartmoor. There's all sorts of sites, but none that you can look at and say that must have been immensely important. Yeah, yeah. This one, I think, I think uh, uh, Ga Ga uh, Gaza Six is probably quite right. If you think of it of a, a, as a clava can, you're not f too far not off. You're, you're not far off with that, really. The clava yeah. cans um, have, all, a, have an entrance passage, and uh, you know that kind yeah, of thing going all, on. But... Although substantially larger. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and Tim. So, what age was it? Uh, really good. And um, yeah, if our discussions with um, uh, Lee or anything to go by um, they are being pushed uh, back a bit I think yeah um, so it's uh, because you know it has to be said that m nearly all the archaeology on Dartmoor yeah I is, think this is one uh, though is it has probably, been robbed out completely there are, I, there are, I doubt that yeah. there's any datable evidence on this site at all so one would just have to uh, uh, link it with other stuff going on at the time there's nothing mm. you can't do carbon dating on, on this site and get a really precise date I think I better move on though yes uh, yes yes Rupert. move on move yeah. on yes okay dokie there's no alignment amongst the stones to suggest astronomy and there's no central kist to suggest an elaborate burial, just these enigmatic rings. Mm. Oh, I'm just going to pause it again because um, um, uh, Paulus is, says, uh, asks, how open was that landscape back when the monuments were built, which is a really uh, uh, important question. Mm. Uh, when the monuments were built, it wouldn't have been as it, obviously nothing like as clear as it is now. They would already yeah. have uh, have made uh, substantial clearings. Um, but they would have been clearings within substantial woodland. So there would still have been a lot of forest there, mm -hmm. if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's more detail in that with our discussion with the, um, Lee. I forget, keep forgetting his surname. How awful. Lee Bray. Lee Bray. That's it. Um, yeah, so watch it, watch out for, for that. Um, before I move on again, environmental archaeology says it was woodland. Um, mm. y yeah, but there was a lot of um, clearing going on at the same time. Um, was there something else I caught? Who said, wh where was it again, guys? Uh, t that's, that's Yellowmead. That's Yellowmead, yeah, which uh -huh. is near Princetown. Um, yeah. I That's shall continue. The, the closest main uh, and yeah. Yelverton. There are theories. There's supposed to have been a cairn here, but nobody knows what came first, how it developed, or what it was actually used for. And uh, <laughs> I, I think it looks like a target. 
It's village hunting practice. Nearest spear to the middle wins. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> Ten miles to the east is another oddity that leaves you wondering. Oh, yeah. This is the Greyweather's double stone circle. They're probably early Bronze Age, about 4,000 years old, and when they were excavated in 1898, both circles were found to be strewn with ashes. No one knows whether it was from cremations or domestic burning, or how old the circles were before the burning took place. They're aligned north-south, the southern circle being slightly bigger, and it's been suggested that they were a place for the gathering of the clans. But I think that's silly. You wouldn't create a neutral territory and have one side bigger than the other. We can only guess what they were for. Actually, I was uh, up at uh, Greyweathers last summer, and uh, I hadn't noticed before that uh, the, those two circles on a ridge between two value, valleys. And uh, this is just a you know theory, theory that popped into my head. You know, what better place for you know having the two communities from the two valleys come together on that spot. It's remarkable if you s stand on that spot where the two circles are. Uh, north, you look into one valley. South, you, you look into, a, uh, into another. It, it kind of makes sense when you look at it uh, that way. With that, I shall move on. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome, ancient architects. Glad to see you. <clears throat> Cheers, James. Thanks for joining us. Yes, cheers, James. <laughs> and that is the end of part one of Standing With Stones. My goodness, that went quickly, didn't it? Seriously, we didn't want to do the whole of Standing With Stones in uh, in one sitting. But uh, no, that's uh, that's really interesting to see how that's gone. That's uh, There's no part that is longer than uh, that first part <laughs> there. So, uh, yeah. Mm. So... I enjoyed that. That was great uh, watching that in uh, with uh, in your company. Um, yeah, uh, as I say, mm. that uh, that went quite quickly. So, <laughs> questions, please. Anything that's um, been work. Kevin, brought Kevin up. Kevin says, "Did you get blisters doing all that walking, Rupert?" Do you know what, Kevin? No, I didn't. And uh, and the honest truth is that uh, apart from the fact that. I <laughs> I've been walking very long distances for a very long time. Um, yeah. But no, get yourself a good pair of walking boots that fit you properly. Yeah. And uh, I, I like the phrase, they should be as tight as mummy's bandages. Uh, you lace your <laughs> boots up properly and yeah. uh, and it's just an extension of your foot and you will never get a blister. Um, yeah. I wear I, Mendel I, boots. I, I learned at the Mendel foot of the master on that uh, that front and <laughs> bought myself a very nice yes. pair of, uh, yeah, yes, pair of did. Yeah, boots. honestly, I never suffered uh, either. You know, people say two hundred pounds. Honestly, do it. Mm -hmm. just oh yeah, because it's worth every penny. Um, it it's it just makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, you should yeah. never skimp on walking boots. David, 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 mm. how much alcohol was consumed on our travels? Ah. Oh, there's a tricky question to answer. Do you know what um, the funny thing? Not much. Not a lot. And that's the honest truth, strangely enough. Mm. Yeah. There were a lot we, of cigarettes smoked and a lot of Haribo jelly babies and, and, and stuff oh, you know consumed. We that, really that missed was a trick, a, actually, not getting sponsorship from Haribos. Yeah. Um, yeah, neither of us smoke anymore. Um, mm, I, I mm. gave up smoking. In fact, I, I gave up smoking 10 years ago now. Uh, but, um, yeah, we did smoke a lot and drink a lot of bad food. But the truth is that we, um, whilst we had a right laugh the whole time, we do take our work very seriously. And uh, and we didn't, you know, we would stop if the opportunity arose and it didn't conflict with 
uh, our <laughs> shooting schedule. I call it a schedule, but um, uh, then you know, we would try to sample local beers wherever we could. But you know, yeah. we we never we, we never drank overly because we always had to get up before sunrise the following day. You yeah. know, there was just no point having a skinful. It wouldn't have. Uh, wouldn't have been good. Then big cigarettes. No, no, not big cigarettes. No, 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 no. No, no I no. left that behind a very, very, very long time. Ago. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, yeah, we were pretty good though. <coughs> you're right. It was. It was a. We had a, a very fun time, but gee, it was a hard working time. We really. Didn't have much time to imbibe, shall we say? Yeah. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Do you know? I'm Ke sorry. I just want to respond to a couple of things because Kevin has said what new info would cause you to rewrite "Standing with Stones," and uh, I, I think the honest truth is that because our our knowledge and understanding of archaeology is so much deeper now that. Um, we we wouldn't make it the same way again um, because there are so many things that we now understand. Yeah. Um, well, for instance, what, yellow mead. There is all those ki kinds of things. We, we, there are many mm. things similar to that. You know, which will come. So to it would as make we it very to... different. It, yeah. It would make it very different. But I mean, I would love to. It, the honest mm. answer is, I would absolutely love to. But yeah. um, but we would need proper budget. And as mm, some of you mm. will have heard us say before, we promised our wives that we wouldn't uh, sell fund and project like that. But fu fund fundamentally, though, the film wouldn't change whatever the information was because we didn't set out for it to be a history lesson. Yes, it was a question of imparting information as we came to it, as we came to each stone. But this, the film was about it was a a, a travelogue. Um, you know, with a beginning, middle and end and a rhythm and a pace to it, hopefully, that the job was to take us away from, from Stonehenge. And the interesting thing is, I think what we would do now, and it would probably a trap that would um, probably distract from how, the way Standing with Stones works now, but we would probably be mindful of how these sites relate to each other chronologically, mm. we did we you know we we did a topological journey, a map journey, but we didn't do a journey through time. If we if you take if you'd taken a sort of time scale um, through all the sites that we'd visited, you'd, you'd get you'd get whiplash. We'd be going backwards, you know, a thousand years here, forward of five hundred years back another 500 years, forward 1,000 years, back 1,000. You know, we'd be all over the place. And, but you, that, that was never a point um, that we were able to make in, in the film about the, mm. you know, the breadth of time that we were uh, yeah. covering. Yeah. If we were to it, make another film, I think it would be about the chronology. More, you know, it would, be a, it would be a journey more through time than through space, if you see what I mean. Yes. Yes, maybe. I mean, it's it's a tricky one because if you take it into another, um, I don't know what word to use there, but if we took it into another realm, you know, the, uh, it, you know, looking at the 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 Neolithic and Bronze Age of uh, of Britain and Ireland, uh, what story would we want to tell? Uh, and even now, I think you know, as Michael just said, really that. Uh, it's difficult to to make a story of it, other than a, uh, other than what we did here, as it being a journey. You know, it makes sense as a journey. If you try to do it uh, chronologically, it is so complex yeah. that I don't think it would be uh, as engaging as a, as a piece to actually sit down and watch it. It would be a mind numbing history lesson. Uh, oh no, so we'd make it interesting. Um, we would. We'd make it lovely because we're mm. lovely. Um, and <laughs> no, but there is a story. There is a thread. Um, yeah, I think there's a very the, exciting the, thread. And there's yeah, okay. I mean, to be fair, there's more than one thread. But I still think that um, that you couldn't. It wouldn't be a journey. We'd we'd be hopping around all over the British Isles to make sense of the chronology. Um, 
you know, we could do journeys, you know, we've talked about the journey of the axe, you know, that bringing yeah. the axe into uh, Britain, but you could do the same with, uh, you know, with the Beaker people and, uh, you know, and metal coming into Britain. And it's just suddenly it becomes something that is not as personally engaging as a journey. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think there's any way of avoiding that. Um, uh, you know, it would be interesting to know from uh, f- uh, from you guys, you know, you know, what is it, you know, look at you engaging with this about a film that we made back then. Yeah. Uh, so what is it for you that made this film s- such a yeah. pleasure to watch? Uh, yeah. You know, because <laughs> we're eternally grateful for that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if it if it had not been... Uh, you know, essentially, you know what 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 we're putting out there is this this personal journey. Um, uh, so, you know, what what was it that um, uh, that made it so engaging? Are you wrestling with Leica? Yes, yes, because my cat has been hammering on the window for. He's given up now. He's oh. gone over to. Uh, Gone over his pest to Julie, <clears throat> but yeah. Um, yeah. There's a couple of uh, questions about favourite uh, experiences and 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 sites, and you know I've, I've been racking while you've been talking. I've been thinking about oh, was that, and but then there was that, and then was that on Dartmoor, but Cornwall. The weather was so nice, and all all the mm. rest of it. Um, yeah, yeah. I tell you, I, I can tell you the worst experience. Easy. <laughs> Because before we started filming uh, together, when I first got hold of the uh, the camper van, I went down to Cornwall. Uh, no, I down to Dart. <laughs> I went down to Dartmoor on my yeah, own yeah, yeah, yeah. to do so, do some filming um, <laughs> to, to pick up some uh, B roll. You know, before we started to you know just check out the systems and make sure the camper was good. And uh, yeah, uh, no. anyway, I was on my own. Long story short. I was trying to get to Merivale, the Stone Roads, and lo and behold, uh, we're talking about uh, 2005, uh, 2005 sat-nav here, okay? Uh, And I had sat-nav, and believe it or not, Merivale Stone Roads came up on the sat-nav. I thought, oh, great, that'll take me there. I can't remember, Rupert had been there before, I couldn't remember exactly how to get there. I pressed the button, started following the (laughs) sat-nav. And we're going round and round, I think, this is not right. But anyway, it had a route. (laughs) And I don't know if you know uh, Devon Roads, but the Devon (laughs) Roads, and I had been trouble, I was having trouble with the engine of the camper because it was going uphill, it tended to conk out or get very weak, so I had to keep my the pedal to the metal to keep it going. Anyway, the road kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower. We're talking about single carriageway here. And then the hedge is coming up either side, and I found myself going uphill, and the road actually became narrower than the camper van, I kid you not. It was like that scene in The Empire Strikes Back where... Um, <laughs> Uh, the Millennium Falcon is bouncing off uh, asteroids on its way to trying to escape the... It, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, the, the awning got ripped off, uh, and, I, I, but, and I was sweating, and I, had my, I just couldn't stop because I'd be wedged there forever. <laughs> so I had my, yeah, my foot to the floor thing. going up this road that was narrower than the camper van and hearing the sound of... <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, yeah. I burst out into mm. a farmyard, turned around, and had to go back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the 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 camper in the end at the end of the day wasn't that uh, worse for wear, um, but um, hey ho, hey ho, yeah. That yeah. See, when I was wrecking for, um, uh, in fact, when I was wrecking for for the pilot, so you know, long before we made the film. And uh, you know my my habit is, I like to walk. Um, I like to backpack because then you just pitch camp. You know, I mean, I'll decide beforehand where I, roughly where I wanted to pitch camp for the night. But it means you never have to get back to a vehicle. You just walk. And uh, yeah, I like that. So I really felt for Michael when he told me about the grief he had been having. You know, it's not like you you can't desert your vehicle, but uh, yeah, you yeah. can carry your tent. 
Yeah, Chile asks, uh, where, did we end up being right about the petrified uh, tree? Uh, long story oh. short on that. Uh, no, we did not. But we found out what the truth about that was, which was really great. Um, but uh, that'll be in um, ep- part three. Yeah, towards the end of part three, if you're around uh, when we do the watch party on part three, Chile, we'll, we'll mm. get into that a bit deeper. We we have done various broadcasts about it, and there's certainly an update on my website about it. We, we've yeah. done various updates. A um, bit long-winded to go into it now, but um, uh, but yes, we did solve the mystery in the end. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, right. There were, uh, it's and so did you ever imagine how big Standing With Stones would become our review? No, no. It was such a surprise when it took off uh, April, mm. um, almost this time last year. Oh, do you know uh, what? It just, just went uh, mad. It, it did, yes, yeah, surprisingly. Uh, Martin's asked, uh, so before Caledonia, Martin's asked, would we do a European version? Martin, um, <laughs> going back when standing with stones was done and the book was done and uh you know and the um the next project was going to be a european one um and uh, in fact i still have the map um of how i'd planned the route and uh yeah, <laughs> and it never happened because um, it was that old thing of uh, of money that uh, it would just have cost us so much, and we couldn't do it uh, on our own. And uh, and and again, you know, back then crowdfunding wasn't a thing either. Um, and I, I know it's cropped up a couple of times in the comments um, earlier on about uh, you know could we crowd crowdfund the next one, yeah. And uh, and yes, definitely. the The thing is though that what what we're doing now is we're crowdfunding, or we will be crowdfunding for very specific projects, uh, because what we have now is uh, you know we've got the stuff that we do that we produce for the YouTube channel. We've got the stuff that we produce for Patreon um, as well. So, th- you know, th- this is our full-time job now, um, uh, even though it's 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 still a hand-to-mouth existence, but we're getting there. Um, uh, uh, and so the thing is that if we were going to crowdfund a new film, then it would have to be something that we knew we could do without it getting in the way of our other commitments. Uh, You know, we we, we can't say to all our patrons, you know, here you are, we're giving you all this, uh, you know, we're giving you this stuff every month. Oh, do you know what? We won't be giving you anything for a year. Um, We can't do that. So we, we are uh, not it, gentlemen it, of independent means, are we? No, we are not. Put it that we way. are not. We are not Victorian antiquarians. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazon. That's, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, folks, thank you for your really uh, kind co- comments. Who, who, was it, who was it said it'd been the film that had been waiting to be made? I think, I think no, that it was, was David. It was, that was David's David, the film that. I've been waiting for years. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think, uh, you know, that's why we made, I think, that to a certain extent, that was it. Why hasn't anybody done this? Oh right, mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be. Why. Who's going to do? It? Who? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, how about a series rather than a film? Yeah, it's all a question of, of of what you know works for people. What works for for the audience? Um, it uh, you know what has? How does the story work? Um, mm. Because it, it, it's a, it's a very different kettle of fish making a series. I, I I think a series would be great because I think the there's such a huge story be, to be told. If we were doing something similar to Standing with Stones again, I think what we're aware of now, how much bigger of a story it is. He said, being a bit American in his grammar there, um, <laughs> how much bigger the story is, and how we would. Comp- possibly uh, get that into a two uh you know whatever whatever film um but a series again however um at the moment it's very hard to think in terms of the logistics because 
there's so much flux about what you can and cannot do, where you can and cannot go at the moment. Um, you know, wondering when the world will open up a bit so that uh, we could do something a bit more uh, international. Uh, we had plans for this year, but they're a bit on hold still because of the insecurity and in, uh, being unsure about where we can film and when and with what. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, whether Rupert year, can travel to, freely to uh, England mm. and uh, and yes, whether he can get back home again being, at the end of it. Exactly. France is being deplorable with COVID vaccines. Really rubbish. I have only just managed mm. to get uh, schedules for my 91-year-old father's uh, vaccinations. Uh, mm. You can't get vaccines unless you're over 75 at the moment. Um, so Lord knows when it will happen for us. Anyway, we'll see. We'll mm. see. Mm. Um People have asked about the reprint of the book. Uh, oh, yeah. The reality is that um, uh, it, it's a, the, the trouble with publishing these days. You know, it, it's a niche product, uh, and publishers are not like they used to be, where they you know, where they just wanted to keep a book in print. Uh, you know that if they don't make uh, you know tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, easily, then they're not interested. Mm. Uh, so Thames and Hudson, uh, you know, I mean, they were talking about maybe reprinting it. They haven't come back with anything def uh, definitive. I could reclaim the rights and reprint it, but the reality is the photographs in the book were all taken uh, on slide film during our shooting schedule. Uh, there were only a few of them that I travelled to separately. And uh, and so photographically, I'm not happy with it anyway, so I'd want to go and reshoot the whole thing if I was going to reprint it. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, uh, we have another book in the pipeline that's uh, it, it's being slow because we're just so busy with everything else that we do here. But... Um, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe one day, maybe yeah. one day. And you've got to bear in mind, you know, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, plot spoil, there is no money in books. No, there isn't. There isn't. The only way to make money out of books is, and I'm not joking here, the only way to make money out of books is either to write something like Fifty Shades of Grey, Sex Always Sells, or, uh, or a, you know, just a real page turner. Like, mm. you know, I can't. I don't read novels, so, um, mm. Mm. Uh, so I can't think of a good example. But, but no, I mean, Archaeology Press. No, yeah, you yeah. know, you, you need to have fifty books in print. It needs to be someone like Tim Darville, yeah. you know, who's you could, got you Lord knows how many make, books that he's done. Uh, you, you, you get a few hundred quid a year off each one, and it and it adds up to something. But uh, it's yeah. you don't make money out of books. Could make uh, possibly make some pocket money self publishing, but. Uh, it's uh, just self-publishing. It's, it's just it, it's do you know the what they call it vanity it? publishing for a reason. Yeah, you know, it's mm -hmm. like if your if your product isn't good enough for a publisher to say we'll have that, then you have to question whether it's a good idea in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> is my view, mm. um, but. Um, yeah, we'll but see. That, all we'll that see. said, we do welcome your suggestions and your enthusiasm. Uh, Kev, grow mm. our patrons, um, uh, absolutely, and probably uh, hand and <coughs> heart. We're probably not doing uh, a, a, you know, a good a job as we could do in terms of uh, growing the, the patronage. If you've got any um, really good ideas uh, as far as that is concerned but I, th I think you're absolutely right growing our patronage and also um, having enough followers and supporters also on YouTube so that when it push comes to shove and we do put out uh, some kind of crowdfunding Kickstarter campaign that we, uh, the, the numbers of people that we're appealing to is uh, you know will scale nicely um, to uh, having a good result um, yeah you, you you've got to build up a following before you uh, ask for yeah. money <laughs> indeed uh, yeah you know, thank you Matt and people have got to know um, yes uh, uh, Candide says can't wait for the Machu Picchu episode well do you know what uh, Candide, <laughs> that, 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 that's a two-edged sword there number one Peru is my favorite country in the whole world um, yeah. and uh, and I have always had since I was very very small I can't tell you why I have yeah. had a deep, deep, deep love of all things Inca, 
But um, uh, so I wouldn't need any excuse to go back to Machu Picchu and Wayne Picchu. But um, the trouble is, it's too late. It's too late. Yeah. We're near Lithic and Bronze Age. It's not. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Paul and Rebecca, um, uh, have you considered YouTube membership? Uh, absolutely we have, but I don't see how we could run a, me a YouTube membership at the same time as a, as a Patreon membership. I think, I think there would be a sort of bit of a conflict um, mm. there. Um, yeah, so uh, we've chosen not to have YouTube membership um although uh we do have i'm sorry about the noisy dog who <laughs> thinks i should be elsewhere oh is that what oh can you hear what, it? you should be on the sofa is that what yeah, it is yeah 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 you're not in, you're not in the so on the sofa watching the television <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that mm. Rata, come here you want to be on the mm. no, you don't um yeah uh it, it, tempting I, I like the idea of it all being you know wrapped up in the um um youtube um environment uh, as it were uh it, but alongside patreon I, I don't think it's a it's a good idea um, it, yeah it's tricky to have more than one sort of membership stream really uh, yeah it, uh, we it, do we, uh, we don't advertise them but there, you know if people want to there are super chats on on the on the chats here um, if people want to throw the Diane in. says our other channels run both uh, yeah I, do you know I, mm. the, the trouble is to be honest it, it, for us anyway that um, uh, we just find that our time is is already you know we we struggle to find enough hours in the day and mm. and it just becomes another thing that you have to manage yeah um, actually I don't think YouTube m uh, membership needs that much management actually I think it's a much more loose uh, really? thing as, as yeah as long as you have members only stuff do they take a silly percentage YouTube, though because it, they take uh, a more yeah yeah uh, but uh, that's a that's an, mm. another d discussion and um, yeah Indeed. well consider it but you know the uh, you guys you know you're all on patreon there's a certain political thing about you know managing two communities mm. don't want to split our attention you know we, we, there's, there's a certain uh, um, loyalty thing there um you know if we go if we're advertising our patreon as a the standing with the the, the uh, prehistory guys um community then it doesn't feel quite right to have another community who can have our attention. We much prefer it. You know, it's much more authentic to have everybody under one umbrella, as it were. I thought that's my uh, that's why my, mm. my, my thinking about YouTube membership. Anyway, yeah. In many ways, it would be simpler, but uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is a great conversation to be having, um, but I'm aware of uh, the time, and we're not talking about prehistory. We're talking about prehistory guys. A sort of a uh, bit of naval examination going on there. I don't know if this is the time uh, or, or the place, but uh, your your input is uh, is really really welcome uh, because nobody gives you a a handbook for how to do these things. <laughs> Everybody's. Uh, got an individual case and uh, not, you know somebody else's experience writing about cats is not the same as writing about rocks in fields or making programs about uh, about rocks in fields you know it's, uh, mm. it's yeah there is no manual for this um yay mm -hmm. Anyway, I can feel myself uh, uh, winding up. Unless you've spotted uh, uh, something no, in the it's chat just, there. I, I, no, I, I'm just I'm being I'm trying to be self-disciplined here, but not in a rude way. Because there's a number of comments that are coming in that uh, that are really Peru-based, and uh, oh. uh, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to jump. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I, it's uh, it's an interesting one. The thing is that you, you know you find yourself getting into. Uh, we, okay, put it another way. We have a reputation that we are quietly quite proud of in that we keep things real. Um, and if we tell you something that's not true, uh, if we find out that we've made a mistake on anything, yeah. then at the earliest opportunity, we redress that and we tell you that we've made a mistake. It doesn't happen very mm. often because we mm. are very, very thorough in our research and everything else. Um, the problem with uh, a lot of the... Uh, 
uh, not just Inca, you know, there's Olmec, Toltec, there's all sorts of, of the, you know, South American cultures. Um, uh, the Tyrona, who are very dear to my heart. But um, uh, the thing is that so little is actually known because uh, you know it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a culture with writing. Uh, they uh, you know the, the way they they kept their information is not something that we know about. Uh, and so you have globally you have a whole load of. I might be a bit harsh to say nonsense, but people make up a whole load of stuff. Uh, and there are an awful lot of things that are put out as fact when they're really not. They're very much maybes. And, and uh, you know, and our feeling is very much that there's not really any point in making films to show you stuff if we can't actually be imparting knowledge you know, we're we're not just making, say, holiday programs where we're saying, you know, hey, have a look at this, isn't it stunningly beautiful? Which, you know, it's very nice. But, but you know, our our thing is, you know, we always try to make it something where we we are actually contributing to a body of knowledge. Um, and I I honestly don't believe, much as I would love any excuse to go back to Peru, my favourite town, probably in the whole world, is Olantitambo. Oh, do you know what? My heart is in that place. But um, but you know, it's like what what could we what could we do? You know, we could make you a lovely film and show you some of the wonderful things, but we couldn't tell you anything that uh, yeah, that is not yeah. already there. Yeah. Uh, you know, in yeah. grabbable knowledge, if you see what I mean. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I, uh, that's a really, really good point. I think you know that is what if it, the story we need a story that hasn't been told before or hasn't been mm. synthesized. Uh, before, in order to get our juices going and, uh, and and get out there and get the camera turning and, and, and start writing and stuff like that. So, as as Jimi Hendrix said, you can leave if you want to. We're just jamming. That that's all. <laughs> yes, thank you, Stone Age Steve. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Uh, we are sort of towards the, the the end of this show, and I would tell you, I can't tell you how much I appreciate um, your presence and your your contribution, folks. Um, mm. So uh, I, I think that's about time to say ta ta. Actually, um, for now. Yes. Well, um, well, we haven't scheduled the next one. When are we doing the next one, Michael? No, we haven't, uh, and I don't know when we're doing uh, the no, next we'll, one. No, we'll 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 let you know uh, soon. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but it won't be far away. Yeah, yeah, it won't yeah, be far yeah. away. <laughs> Jennifer, bless you, Jennifer. That's probably <laughs> about right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fair enough okay it's fair till the next time folks see you soon folks take good care bye bye